Well, it's been a year, folks, and in that year, Donald Trump has managed to take our global reputation and not only run over it a couple times with a big Mack truck, but he also put it through a paper shredder. But Rich, I'll let you tell the story. Right. So it's been a year since Donald Trump was elected president. It's been a, a year to reflect. Um, so it's been a year since he was elected, but he didn't really assume office um, until a couple January months after, right? January 21st. So we can't even really reflect on Donald Trump's first year quite yet. Um, but this is a good place to, you know, round up a little bit and, and talk about this. Now, for me, I'm... I'm pretty pessimistic at this point, right? I'm saying if we can get through three more years of Donald Trump without World War III breaking out, like, great job. We, we did it. We did it, folks. We get to pick someone else. If we elect Donald Trump again, then I'm just done. I, just, I got nothing. Like, it's I possible. I don't know what to tell you at this point. But uh, the numbers are not in favor of, you know, another, <laughs> another four years of DJT. Um, so anyway... This article and what we want to talk about this segment um, is how the image of the United States, the greatest nation in the world, you know, the bastion of industry, the innovators, um, the country that people look up to, has gone down the tank in the last year since Donald Trump has been elected. So Donald Trump's management of U.S. foreign policy has actually been laughable. Um, when you talk about diplomats in the State Department as a whole. Um, there's been massive budget cuts. Um, High-level lifetime diplomats, folks that have been building relationships for their entire career, they've been doing one thing for their entire career, are leaving the State Department in mass right now. Um, meanwhile, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson um, is really being undercut. Um, Donald Trump is farming out foreign policy advice to his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Um, he's also using Gary Cohn, the head of the National Economic Council, um, to do jobs that should be, you know, done by Rex Tillerson. Um, he's also letting Nikki Haley, who's our UN ambassador, speak on issues that normally should be under the purview of the Secretary of State. Donald Trump is basically dismantling, you know, American foreign policy, American foreign, foreign policy with no real replacement. Right. He's just saying, like, I don't want this to work. And anymore. I mean, you got to think about it. Like, I think uh, and let's talk about the U.N. for just a second. Sure. So the United States was one of 13 countries. No, we were one of the 13 countries. Now, the other 13 countries include places like Syria. Syria is now on board. For the no, record. Yeah. Not, no. We're talking about something totally different. Okay. Syria, oh, well, I. Okay. Well, we could talk about that, too. <laughs> um, That's another example. Syria, Bahrain, countries that are known for like. Human rights violations. Human rights violations. And us, we're the 13 countries that... A country that is newly known for human rights, rights violations. violations. Right? We're one of the 13 countries to vote against a United Nations motion to condemn the death penalty for same-sex couples and gay people across the country. All right. So while she speaks out of one mouth about what's happening to the gay people in Chechnya and how awful it is, yeah. out of the next mouth, she votes down a motion that would have helped... Gay people survive. So what's the rationale for that? Is Donald Trump like, it's a bad deal. It's a bad deal for us. We need to get better. Before we agree to this, we got to get a better deal. Of course. I mean, the same thing he done the Paris Accords. Now, we are the only nation yep. that are not members of the Paris Accord. Right. Because Syria. Our, Syria was the only holdout. Was the only holdout. And, like, Syria's only really, like, three blocks left. I mean, it's really <laughs> only, like, where Bashar al-Assad lives. Right. That's it. Because the rest of the country, half of it's ISIS, the other half is rebels. It's a mess. Mm -hmm. But he was like, listen, I'll sign the Paris Accords, though. I'll do that. <laughs> so, I mean, you're totally right. And here are more things, because this is all happening in your mind, you. Uh, the TPP trade agreement. Well, that agreement. was a good move. That was a good move. Richard's you got to gonna... give the president credit where credit is due. Withdrawing the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership was a good move because it endorsed and called for and basically allowed for open slavery in Malaysia because for the deal to happen... And I'll harp on this point. And for the Obama church knew this. For this deal to happen, they needed the Straits of Malacca. And right. in order for them to get the Straits of Malacca, they basically had to say, all right, Malaysia, you can have slaves. And those slaves, now, pre, you're like, you know, slavery? I don't believe that. What, is, what are these slaves doing? So if you buy your shrimp from Costco or Sam's or any of the big box bulk stores, maybe Walmart, and 99.9% .9 of the times, your shrimp is probably made via slave labor in Malaysia. 
Right. Just so you know. I mean, but let's be let's be clear here. Like to inform uh, you. Donald Trump did not drop out of the TPP because he cared about slaves in Malaysia. No, he well, he thought it was a bad deal for the American worker, and I agree right. with him. And coincidentally, it also. <laughs> had that side effect. Okay, so other things Donald Trump's doing. Threatening to walk away from the Iran nuclear deal, That's which is just a deal. mistake. Angering European allies who see America going back on its word with that deal. Vowing to build a wall on the new U.S.-Mexico border. Pulling out of NAFTA. Now, <laughs> Richard Fowler. <laughs> Tough on trade, Richard Fowler. No, well, I see, like, pulling out of NAFTA is not, I, I mean, I think Pulling, I don't think I would call what he's doing pulling out of NAFTA. I think that I'm there is... Threatening to pull out? No, I think that NAFTA needs to be reworked to benefit that, the American worker. Deal. It is a bad, but, bad but NAFTA, come on. NAFTA's not a bad deal for the American worker. Mind you, those jobs are going to go overseas regardless. Sure. But NAFTA basically said you can go overseas faster, like Maquila Dores. There's a word created because of NAFTA. The yeah. factories that skip the border... I mean, I don't labor. know what the right thing is to do there. I mean, is American manufacturing even something we're still trying to protect? Like, We should always try to protect American manufacturing. These are hardworking, blue-collar Americans. It depends on what it is, though, right? So what, 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 what should we do with them? What, what should happen? I mean, people are smart. They can do things other than manufacturing. So what do you say to the auto workers in, Michigan, in Detroit, Michigan? I'm when you just close saying, their factory down I'm just and saying move there's their jobs no, to China? I'm saying there's no easy answer. Like, there's always going to be some level of outsourcing. Like, what? there is no easy answer, right? Well, like, no, I think we can stop. The problem is, is this. We allow the countries that do the outsourcing, who are the countries who receive the outsourcing, so they would be mm -hmm. the insourcer of the outsourcing, right? What we do is we allow them to get away with trade atrocities that are ridiculous. I mean, sure. China has manipulating currency. They do, they, they, like, I mean, we could demand... We could demand, if you're bringing these products back into the United States, that you have to have certain labor standards with, for free trade agreements. I agree with that. I think that that's right. Brain. Like, I think that there's room for us to do that. And I, I can go talk at length about in the TTIP negotiations, which is they're trying to create a free trade agreement between the United, between North America and Europe. And I actually think the TTIP is a great opportunity for the left and the progressives to say, we believe in, free, we believe in fair trade and trading with Europe will give the United States an opportunity to basically rate, because I mean, the European working standards are up here. Their labor standards are very high. Right. Our labor standards are shit at best, right? So if we are trading with the Europeans in TTIP, which we're, we'll see where TTIP goes under President Trump, it might be, it's probably dead in, the, dead in the water, but it allows us for us to then level the playing field a little bit and move American labor standards up a notch. Yeah. What NAFTA does, what the trans Partnership does is it uh, takes our labor standards down a notch because you end up having a race to the bottom on wages because you're competing with... We, American workers can't compete with Singapore because the cost of living in Singapore is a fourth... The, and Singapore is the wrong country. Indonesia. Uh, um, Indone you can't compete with Indonesia because the cost of living in Indonesia is a fourth of what the cost of living here is. Here is. So it's, it's going to be... They're, they're like they're not even... It's like comparing apples and oranges. So, but with that being said, I think... It is the job of an American president to look out for those workers. And I think for far too long, both Democrats and Republicans have neglected these workers. And they've neglected these workers. And the reason why these workers voted for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton, the reason why these workers overwhelmingly rejected Democrats in midterm elections, because these workers are saying to they're saying to both parties and both establishments, look at us. We're here. We built this country on our backs. Okay? If there was no Ford Auto Company, there would be no America. This, we, were, we built this country. Yes, Ford is a name, but Ford is nothing without the United Auto Workers. And those workers that work really hard to produce those damn cars. Same goes for all the other manufacturing companies that we have in this country. And so to neglect those workers and to not remember those workers when we go into negotiations with foreign leaders because we want a better trade line, and these trades will make our economy stronger, you make our economy stronger for the hedge fund managers who work on Wall Street who have $2,000 suits, but the Detroit auto worker is living in piss poor conditions. That's not a solution. And so that's why people voted for Donald Trump, and I think it's very important for progressives like yourself and others to be like, oh, there's no real solution to this. No, we need to find a solution and we need to have an answer for these workers.